All right, uh, thank you very much for um, having me tonight. I'm looking forward to this. Um, so we're gonna talk about pollinator conservation in New Jersey, and it's a rather broad topic. So we're gonna focus on bees, but when it comes to poll you know, bees and butterflies, there's kind of two parts to this talk. The first part's gonna be about bee diversity and conservation. And the second part's gonna be about um, the butterflies in New Jersey. But when it comes to pollinators, there's a lot of other things beyond bees that do pollination as well, including um, like a lot of flower beetles. I know people that specialize in research on those things like uh, bats and uh, hummingbirds in some places, as well as flies and wasps and things. So there's a lot of things that go into the, um, the world of pollinators. So hopefully show you a little bit about all of them here and some of the work that we're doing together with them. Um, so to start off with a little bit about myself, I always like to do a little introduction and um, let you a little know a little bit about who I am, where I'm from. You know, sometimes we can find like common things to talk about, you know, a little different remotely versus in person. But um, I went to Stockton University. Um, I got my or BS in environmental science, environmental studies. I got, went to Rutgers University for a master's degree. Um, I've worked for Fish and Wildlife for over 14 years now, which has flown by. I'm our Pinelands Regional Biologist, and I also um, am the lead on insect conservation in New Jersey. Um, before this, I worked you know, for the Health Department doing environmental enforcement. I've worked for the US Forest Service, um, to, um, working in fire ecology and the Glo Global Climate Change Project. And then um, I worked for Rutgers for a number of years as well, doing um, entomology research as well as some uh, bee research back then. And on the side, yeah, I'm a volunteer fireman, I'm, you know, really involved in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and things like that. So anything to be in the outdoors. So there's a lot of attention being um, given to bees and pollinators now because of the population de declines that they are suffering. Um, you know, same thing to have the butterflies and a great many other species. Um, you know, the monarch butterfly draws a lot of attention at their population decline. And um, the kinds are linked to a variety of different things on um, land use change, you know, whether it be, you know, change in agricultural practices, you know, development, habitat fragmentation, um, foreign diseases, you know, introduced diseases that came from like introduced bee species that came along with honeybees and things. Um, pesticide use can um, have a, quite a bit of um, an impact as well as habitat loss and change. So there's a lot going on with, you know, bees and pollinators. We, we're trying at the state to um, see what we can do to address the problem. Now, the first thing that comes to mind for so many people when it comes to pollinators and bees is the honeybee. That's the first thing people think of. Um, and it's, you know, not native to North America, but it's introduced and used in agriculture. It's the official state bug of New Jersey. And they do play an important role for um, agricultural pollination, but they're not the entire story. Um, when it comes to native bees, they do a significant amount of pollination. Even when you're looking at like cranberries and blueberries, or maybe it's only like a quarter to pollination. This is from some research, you know, conducted by Rutgers. Uh, you know, 25% on hundreds of thousands of acres of land can be a significant amount of pollination that occurs. So native bees, even though they're they're small and they're not the, the standard honeybee you think of, they're really important for pollination of quite a few different crops. Um, so to get into pollinators, I want to talk to a little bit about the habitat and diversity that occurs, what is pollinator habitat, and then get into the bees that occupy the habitat. So I always like to ask people like, well, what is good pollinator habitat? What is good bee habitat? Like what comes to mind when you think of that? And um, here we have a you know, nice picture of a lot of you know, flowers in the median of a highway. I think they're all cosmos, which is pretty popular for roadway plantings and things like that. And a lot of times people think of like these beautiful, huge, you know, flower meadows for pollinator habitat. And that is, you know, it's good for bees, and it's good for pollination, but maybe it's not the best or most optimal thing to think about. And I want people to just kind of like go home thinking about how unique and diverse bees are at the end of the day. So first things first, you know, it's along the edges of roadways, which can cause, you know, like other animals get hit on roads, bees get hit on windshields and grills, you know, so like having bees planting right next to the highway, not necessarily the best thing. And the second thing is, is like it's all one species of flower. Um, so when the flowering is done, there's, you know, likely not to be too much else there for like other bees, you know, and we've talked about there being over 300 species of bees in New Jersey. All their life histories are unique. All their flight periods are different. The flowers and plants they depend on are very different from each other. Obviously, there's some generalists in there, but a lot of them are specialists. So I always like to talk about like pollinator habitat. It's like you got to think more about your native grasslands with mixed grasses and then your, you know, a wide variety of flowers and other plant species mixed in and like with your warm season grass kind of prairie grassland habitats the grass kind of serves as the backbone to the habitat you know a lot of the flowering plants you know don't really last in the environment system very long you know they kind of decompose or fade away relatively quick you know they flower set seed and then they're kind of done with their life versus grasses are you know a lot more hardy and, and stay in the system longer 
and it provides a kind of structure to the system. And the grass is important nesting habitat, which a lot of people think about the, um, the pollination nectar and for bees, but nesting is really critical habitat space for them. A lot of bees nest in hollow grass stems. A lot of the solitary bees, you know, you, everybody likes to build, the, you know, install bee houses with all the little bamboo and stuff. The natural habitat is grass stems that that is based on for those species. And then other things like bumblebees like to nest down in the, you know, the grass or the root clump at the bottom of it. So it's kind of like an important kind of backbone. And, you know, the grass is always there to have it that all year long. So when you, you know, think of some of like the really prime kind of pollinator habitats, you're looking at like a, a native prairie and grassland with a mix of wildflowers, different species of flowers, different times of flowering, different types of grass and things. And this is good for bees. The different grasses are a great many times food plants are different butterfly species, you know. So having that diversity in the system is really important. And this can be replicated, you know, on a small scale just in your yard, if you like. Um, to talk about bee diversity, of those 350 species of bees, there are dune and beach specialists that only live along coastal areas. There are species that um, specialize in sinusoroides, which is um, the salt marsh cord grass, the tall cord grass, and they actually nest in the stems of the cord grass. It's the only nesting habit that they use. And it, it's kind of interesting from a conservation like kind of survey point of view. It's like a lot of times you're doing your bee surveys in the adjacent upland, you'll find these bees in that upland, maybe in your pollinator planting, but their nesting habitat actually depends on the marsh that's adjacent to it. Um, there's species that specialize on pickerel weed. There was a student out of Rutgers University doing research on pickerel weed specialists in the pine barrens this past year. And then, you know, even within your forest, it's like you look at this and it's like, well, how is that kind of pollinator bee habitat? This is down in South Jersey in the pine barrens. We have low bush blueberry, huckleberry, high bush blueberry, and a whole host of pollinators that, you know, depend on those plant species. And the same thing goes in North Jersey and Central Jersey and all the other places where you have all your spring wildflowers that bloom in spring. There's a variety of bees that depend on those in the forest. So many times what, you know, can be pollinator bee habitat goes beyond your traditional meadow and flowers that you might think of. So all that diversity in habitat and ecosystem leads to a great bit of diversity in bees. So we'll talk about New Jersey native bees. Um, this talk is a, a good bit of information that's been put together from um, Rachel Winfrey's lab in Rutgers University, where we've been doing a lot of research and work together with them and some of her students. So to talk about bees, bees have been around for 120 million years, give or take. They've been around as long as flowering plants are here because, you know, flowering plants depend on bees and vice versa, you know, which, which came first, the chicken or the egg. And it's neat to think about these things from an evolutionary point of view, you know, like, like humans like us have only been around for you know, a couple hundred thousand years in our present state, and maybe a couple million, you know, depending on how back you want to go evolutionarily. Bees have been largely the same for 120 million years. So from a from a evolutionary design point of view, they really got something right because not too much has changed. You know, they evolved from like wasps, you know, predatory wasps were involved in, you know, wasps kind of split into the wasps that we have still today, which are predatory, and the bees that depend on pollen and nectar. And bees, you know, depend on the pollen and nectar, the plants depend on them, and their whole life is adapted to pollinating flowers and plants. As their whole existence revolves around whatever flowers that they are depending on. Approximately 20,000 species of bees in the world, 4,000 US, and approximately you know, 350 in New Jersey. These numbers are never really concrete because the taxonomy is always up for debate. There's quite a few bee species that are like not described that are found in New Jersey and other places around here. Where it's like, well, we know there's these bees here, but no one's ever really identified them or described them officially. Or there's just species that's like, well, it should be here, we haven't seen it. So there's usually a little bit of variation in that number there, which is always kind of fun to think about, it's never concrete. Now, when it comes to, you know, the bees, the diversity in sizes, shapes, life history, from what go from one extreme to the other, from being very large to being very small, from being, you know, um, colonial and having colonies like bumblebees are, are social bees versus the majority of them are all solitary bees. So there's only about 10 or 11 species of bumblebees in New Jersey out of that 350. And they're about the only social ones that are the, that we have. There's a handful of other ones that are like semi-social or things like that. But the vast majority of them are all solitary, whether they be mining bees, mason bees, leafcutter bees, you know, living in stems, living in holes in the ground, and whatever other nesting structures that they use. So they're incredibly diverse. When it comes to their lifespan, most of their life is spent 
in the soil or in their nest as a larvae. The adults of most species are really only active for a couple of weeks of the year. You know, they are active for a couple of weeks collecting pollen and nectar to, you know, provide a good home for their egg and larvae. And then, they, you know, and then when the adult's done, especially if it's a specialist bee, it depends on a very small flowering window. That bee is only active when the, the flowers they depend on are in bloom. Then after that, the rest of their life is spent in their nest as a larvae. Here's a couple of the um, nice photos of some Andrina, which are like some of the mining bees. And then a couple, you know, you get them where they're like semi-colonial, I said, you know, it's like there'll be multiple bees nesting in the same kind of location. So it's not like they're necessarily working together, but the habitat is there and maybe, they, you know, there's some protection in having all your nests in one place for defense and things like that, so. Yeah, continuing on with like some of the diversity discussion with them. A lot of times people think of like all the solitary bees being tiny or small little sweat bees. Some of them can be fairly big. Some of the helictus like this one are almost an inch long. Like they're almost the size of a bumblebee. So it's like you can have some pretty big solitary bees. And although, you know, they are very, very small, they're super abundant and make some good crop pollinators, especially in getting lots of different flowers and maybe some other bees can't, or maybe the honeybee can't efficiently pollinate and things like that. They come in a wide variety of colors, you know, metallic blues and greens, especially if anybody's seen some of the sweat bees and their smaller bees you might find during the summer. They are absolutely beautiful. Um, continuing on about like life histories and things, no two of them are li alike. You know, a lot of them have very similar kind of life histories, but some depend on soil, some depend on stems. Some are like the leaf cutter bees, which this photo here illustrates. They actually cut holes in leaves to line their nests with. Hence the name leaf cutter. They're specially adapted um, jaw structures for cutting the leaves here. And they actually you know, wrap and completely encase their nesting in the leaves, which is a really cool adaptation. Other species are adapted and used like plant fibers. So they're not cutting the leaves, they're actually stripping like the kind of filaments and fibers that occur on like plant stems and stalks and things like that. Um, everybody's, you know, favorite villain around their um, house or anybody who has a deck or anything made out of wood is yeah, the carpenter bee, which is also one of our native bees and a very good pollinator. You know, my, my parents have a farm that's been there for a couple hundred years and like how some of the buildings are still standing is beyond me because there are a lot of carpenter bees. They've made Swiss cheese at that place for a long time, but it's still, very, it's still upright. So, but they're another one of our fascinating bees. It's interesting, I have um, some actual logs where we kind of split them down the middle to show the nest chambers and everything like that. And they're, you know, perfectly kind of hollowed out, it's perfectly round. They actually, um, to make that wooden tunnel, it's not like they necessarily chew their way in. They actually kind of got to get a bite and they kind of vibrate and kind of screw. So they kind of drill it, not necessarily chew their way through, kind of leading to a, the perfect round hole that you see, which is really kind of cool. Um, the bumblebees, many people are familiar with those. One of the social ones that have, you know, colonies and nests. There's approximately 10 species in New Jersey. A lot of the bumblebees have suffered, you know, extreme declines, especially like rusty patch, which, you know, makes a lot of news and attention. Rusty patch used to be one of the more, most common bees, like, sampled when Rutgers did surveys like 20, 30 years ago. And now you can't find it anywhere in the state. And bumblebees, you know, going over life history. The overwinter is a female who emerges the following spring to, you know, start the initial colony, the first nest, and start rearing some workers to help her maintain and build the nest and make it bigger and bigger and make more bees. And this is why it's important, like, everybody always hates dandelions in their lawns. And it's like, dandelions are one of the best pollen sources for bumblebees in the spring when they first emerge. When they first come out, there's not really much out there. But there's often dandelions, so... And then, you know, another thing about bumblebees and talking about adaptations, which is kind of fun and talking about the diversity that um, exists there. A great many bumblebees have like resource partitioning based on the length of their tongues and for going into different depth and shape flowers. So this is a bumblebee working on a, um, a bearberry flower. And, you know, a great many, you know, different species of bumblebees have different length tongues depending on the type of flowers they specialize in, which is kind of cool. And then going on with that, I'd usually ask the question of what, what is a cuckoo bird? And what does a cuckoo bird do? Um, but I'm gonna just you know, leave you to think about that. Everybody's familiar with the cuckoo bird and like the redhead duck being another similar species. And what those are, are nest parasites. 
So like the cuckoo bird goes around and lays his eggs inside of other birds' nests and the other birds inadvertently raise um, the cuckoo chicks. And what happens with cuckoo bees, they're nest parasites. Now, their larvae don't necessarily eat or parasitize the other bees' nest. They'll take advantage of the other bees like nectar and pollen and be raised in that other bee's nest, you know. So they're kind of like a nest parasite in that sense. They're not eating the other bee. They're not a parasite of the bee, but they're a parasite of the nest, um, if you want to call it that. There's a whole variety of cuckoo bees. And it's interesting when um, some of the declines have occurred among some of the rare bumblebees, the cuckoo bees that were like linked to those rare bumblebees like rusty patch have also declined along with them. And then just talking about the diversity, um, when we study these things is like the flight periods and things. Um, the time of the year they use that you know varies greatly by the habitat type. All your forest bees emerge earlier in the spring along with all your spring wildflowers versus like your agriculture, like open space, urban grasslands, all those kind of things are more, you know, the summer season. So like, you know, just from a conservation point of view, if we're doing surveys for bees, you know, you have to make sure to time all the habitats and all the windows that may occur during that time period, you know, because each bee is going to be only flying during the time window when its flower is blooming. So very diverse. So all that diversity in all 350 those species leads us to this challenge for the state. There's an awful lot of bees that are very unique and they all look relatively the same. And it makes it challenging from an identification point of view because most of them aren't easily identified in the field. Like uh, most of what was done is um, with sampling and working together with like labs. Um, there's a bee inventory lab um, with the US, Fish, uh, US Department of Agriculture um, that we work together with and then Rutgers University where they you know, collect bee samples and identify them in the lab, especially the hard to identify species. Now the information available online is getting better to identify them on your own. And as people are getting more and more interested in these, more and more time and money is being invested in providing online tools to identify these things, which is which is kind of nice. So if you can photograph one, there is some hope of being able to kind of key it out or get it kind of close as to what species it is. So at the state, trying to address the challenge of like, well, that's a lot of different bees. They're really unique and this is a real challenge. Um, we did a, a big joint project with um, Rachel Winfrey's lab at Rutgers University to kind of take a look at all the bees in New Jersey and say, uh, what exactly do we have here? What is rare? What is not? What is important from them uh, for them from a habit point, habitat point of view? You know, which species are generalist specialists? And answer a whole variety of these questions. Um, so they made a pretty intensive effort on this project. So they went through all the specimens and collection records that uh, you know existed for New Jersey, which was I believe 20,000 some odd specimens, individual bee specimens. So they went through all those looking where they were, you know, where they were collected, which species was it, how much do we know about that species? What happens with a lot of these things is we might be able to identify the species, it may be described, but beyond that, we have no idea what its life history is, what habitat it requires, you know, anything about it. You know, because a lot of times you're just, you know, collecting random samples of bees, going through and identifying them. It's like, okay, we found this bee in this location, but what is it using at that location? Did it just happen to fly to that flower because it was convenient? Does it critically depend on that flower? You know, so part of their analysis was trying to tease some of that out. And as they are working through that, they're trying to look at what data gaps exist. So there are parts of New Jersey that we haven't sampled sufficiently that we should go target. And, you know, especially when you think of like some of the beach dunes and marsh habitats, like they're the places you don't necessarily think to go look for bees for. So we're trying to fill in some of those gaps and see if we can learn about the diversity of bees in New Jersey. You know, New Jersey, like with so many other species, has the Pine Barrens, which is a globally unique place but it's on the southern edge of a lot of northern species ranges and on the northern edge of a lot of southern species ranges. So we get a diversity of dragonflies, butterflies, and a great many other insects and other wildlife. And bees are the same thing. So, and then, you know, all this going with the gold being informing us at the state with our decision-making, like we're looking to manage lands, they will have some base information to look at pollinators and bees in a better way. So some interesting things we found out, we do have one endemic species, Caledes bradleyi, that is only found in New Jersey. There was um, collections records for it from like the 1930s, and then Rutgers um, staff found it again, like just uh, one, probably like the first or second year we were doing this project um, in the Pine Barrens. And it's a unique Pine Barrens endemic species only found in New Jersey, which is very cool. 
And on top of that, we have a lot of other incredibly rare bees that are found precious few places, a lot of them being like pine barren species like this one, nomada a species that depends on cranberries and things. And this is a cuckoo bee parasite of Andrina bees um, found in southern New Jersey. Um, this one's another neat one. Um, this species depends on loose streaf plant oil. So it's not necessarily nectar and pollen, but they actually depend on like the native loose strife plants. You know, a lot of people are familiar with the invasive loose strife. Another incredibly rare one found in New Jersey is Macropus uh, uh, species. And then just looking at, you know, from a management point of view of like what habitat features of some of these really rare bees utilizing, you know, versus, you know, you know, a lot of bees are generalists, they'll use whatever flowers they can use, but a lot of specialist ones depend on things like cranberries and blueberries, especially in the pine barrens. Um, and then there are a lot of willow and dogwood specialists, which was kind of like something I hadn't really even thought or considered, you know, because you kind of try to think beyond your standard thoughts about like what a pollinator meadow may be. And like, oh, well, there's like flowering trees and shrubs that are really important to some of these bees too, to put it, you know, we should uh, consider. So then, you know, you know, getting into thinking about what can we do? Where, where do we take this from, <laughs> from here? Because we're trying to learn as much as we can about the bee diversity in New Jersey and their life histories and things, and then translate that to on the ground habitat work to try and make things better for them. And, you know, like any habitat work is challenging. And like with bees, it's like, well, it's kind of straightforward. You know, we can do pollinator plantings and field plantings like that. It's pretty easy stuff to do. And it does an awful lot of good, you know. So like, you know, doing pollinator plantings, you know, increase native bee abundance. They've done a lot of surveys and sampling, you know, at Rutgers and other universities to assess like, you know, flowering varieties and things like that. So like some of the basic stuff is really good. But then always thinking about the complexities. Like it may appear that there's a... Um, improvement between like old field and pollinator planting for rare bees, but statistically speaking, it really is no difference. And the idea is behind that, and I always just want people to think about it, is like, well, rare bees are specialist bees. So not really dependent on some of those pollinator planting type habitats. So it's like, you know, when you start to try to do research and do conservation work with these species, it's like, gotta make sure we have the whole picture. And if there's like a, uh, like a, blueberry specialist or something else is like well maybe we gotta be looking at forest management and not necessarily field management for that species so and then just you know i want to talk a little bit what we're doing at the state and then we'll talk a little bit about what people can do at home you know so at the state like we're you know at the great position in that we own and manage like hundreds of thousands of acres of land and parks forests wildlife management areas and there's a huge potential to make a difference for pollinating insects in new jersey and, you know, to benefit a lot of pollinating insects, it's pretty easy and straightforward. It's not like a complicated problem to solve, you know. You can just do and change how we manage the land. We can do pollinator planting to change how we do things. And then, you know, even in DEP, like, each organization has a unique um, situation where they can do good for pollinators in different ways. So one of the projects we've been working on together is having a joint project between parks, forestry, and fish and wildlife. And the state parks uh, services a lot of parks, nature centers, a lot of interpretive staff, butterfly gardens, where they have people that can educate the public, they can take care of garden spaces and do kind of like small projects that do great things for pollinators. And then we have a wonderful um, state tree nursery down in Jackson that grows a whole variety of trees and shrubs. And we went to them saying, look, is there a possibility of growing wildflowers and plants? And like, yeah, we love the idea, let's do it. So we started off, you know, this kind of started off with a monarch milkweed thing, you know, looking at milkweed for monarchs and doing, you know, flowers and pollinator stuff for bees and butterflies. And it's kind of morphed into this kind of bigger thing now. And now we started off just growing a couple of varieties of milkweed. And now we're doing like 20, 30 species of wildflowers and butterfly host plants and kind of making kit pollinator gardens with a variety of species that we can take to different parks and plant. Like you can almost instant, have an instantaneous butterfly garden, which is very cool. Um, at Fish and Wildlife is a little bit different in that we don't have parks and nature centers. You know, we have one nature center up at Pequest and, um, and then a lot of offices scattered around. But we don't have really much like staff in the way that the park service does. You know, we can do some small stuff at offices and we do, we've done some pollinator work at Pequest. But what we do is a lot of big field management projects. Like we're managing hundreds and hundreds of acres of grasslands, whether it be for quail or pheasants or for other things like that. And some of the things we looked at doing was like, well, we're working and managing these fields anyway. How can we improve the seed mixes that we're doing to include pollinator seed? You know, pretty straightforward. Like, hey, let's, let's you know, add some seeds to the mix. Try, try and experiment some different things and see how they work. We looked at some of the quail project work and worked together with the quail project to develop a new quail seed mix. 
because once again, going back to the very beginning, we're talking about the grassland kind of component of these habitats. Like at the end of the day, Grim Indian's habitats are just healthy, functioning grasslands and prairie ecosystems. And that benefits a whole host of species and not just bees and butterflies. It depends on, you know, that benefits your grassland birds, your quail and other things like that. So we looked at that and saying, hey, how can we do this better? We're doing this work anyway. Let's try to make an improvement upon it. So we've been doing pollinator gardens statewide. We're up to over 30 at various parks and whamas across the state. You know, I mean, some of them small, like at nature centers, some are bigger, like we do field plantings up a way around and they did a bunch of plantings in some fields up there. On some of our whamas, we're doing hundreds and hundreds of acres of um, pollinator mix and grassland mix in different whamas throughout the state, wildlife management areas. Um, and this is just some of the most recent information from our lands management staff are doing really great things. And they've been increasing the amount of acreage and pollinator habitat statewide. And year after year, they did 453 acres last year, which is just amazing. And once again, like, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, what are they doing pollinator habitat for if I'm, you know, buying my, my stamp for hunting? But it's like, this habitat is good for all the species are there. So kind of you, you think about pollinators, you know, it's got to avoid the tunnel vision of just being pollinators. So, well, this is like healthy grassland prairie habitat for kind of all the species, all the grassland birds are going to utilize it. So it's not necessarily 100% pollinator habitat. It benefits a whole host of different species, you know. So then getting around, what can be done at home? You know, like so much of this stuff is so easy and straightforward, you know. Like such so simple things as just mowing less of your lawn. Take a piece of your lawn and just leave it unmowed. And, you know, it's always kind of curious to see what happens because you never know what exactly will come up, you know. It's like, my, my yard is a botanical masterpiece. It's like, it's a little bit different each year. And, it, and I often leave things to grow just out of curiosity to see exactly what it is. So um, plant natives, you know, mixes of species and flowering times, different varieties of plants, you know, coming back on mowing, leaving the dandelions, like dandelions are real important for bumblebees in spring, you know, reducing the use of chemicals, you know, obvious thing, you know, like pesticides that are controlling like other insects are gonna control your bees too, you know? So it's like, it's not really healthy for them. And then, you know, nesting habitat for bees, you know, a lot of people do the bee houses, which are really great, but do require a little bit of maintenance because once you concentrate a lot of bees into one location, a lot of bee pests and predators will also concentrate on that location eventually. And then talking about some of the burrowing bees, like, you know, even just bare soil patches can be really important to bees. And then native grasses, grasses and hollow stems and things like that are really important. So I figure as we talk about this, I'll show you a part of my front lawn here where my, my little pollinator garden is. And um, I don't even know exactly how many different types of plants I have in there to tell you the truth. A uh, mix of daisies, butterfly, butterfly weed, lupine, there's mountain mints, partridge pea. This big thing here is an elderberry, which is really kind of cool. And um, the one that, the thing I noticed this spring, there was one little stem, a hollow stem over here. And there were three little mason bees kind of hovering around that one hollow stem looking to nest in it. You know, so it's like, that makes you think about the little patches of um, habitat that are important to these things that you may not think of otherwise. And then uh, one thing that's kind of funny to point out is like, I like plants and flowers and I don't like mowing. So I just keep moving my bricks out a little bit more each year and just make it a little bit bigger each year. And maybe someday I won't have to mow any of my lawn and it'll be good for all the bees. Um, you know, uh, Nesting habitat for bees, once again, inside the bee houses, they're really cool, but you do need to maintain them and, you know, clean them, replace them. They, they do make really nice little cardboard tubes that can be used to, like, um, change out some of the bamboo ones. So as they get utilized or banged up, you can swap them out a little bit easier. And then um, it's funny, we're mostly talking about bees. We'll talk about butterflies later. Um, I live up in Edison up in Middlesex County. And it's like you build it, every little bit helps. And if you build it, they, they will come. Most of the lawns around me are very well manicured and grass and wood chips and standard landscaping type things. And um, so I started planting my flowers and my milkweed and all my other stuff that I've got going on here. And within like a year, I had monarchs all over the place with the milkweed. And there's probably no milkweed within a half a mile of my house to the best that I can tell. I've not found any at least. So it's like you kind of build it, they will come. And I get a whole variety of bees and butterflies and other things here. And it always cracks me up because a lot of my neighbors are like, well, how do you get all this cool stuff? Why do you see all these great butterflies? It's like, well, you, you know, you build a little bit of habitat and then you'll have these things, you know? So, which is always nice. So, <clears throat> getting back, you know, what land managers can do, what homeowners can do. Um, from a lands manager point of view, we got to take a little bit more care and attention because we're managing big chunks of property. And it's always kind of like sensitive when we're trying to do management on government land and things like that. So, like, you know, 
looking into the details of going there, monitoring before managing, like the research we were doing together with Rutgers, trying to understand what is there. Um, looking at the, the seeds and all the, for pollinators in general, looking at as much diversity in nectarine plant species as we can, provide the max amount of flowering throughout the entire season. You know, coming back to the first photo of the, uh, the flowers in the roadway, it's like, if you only plant one species of flower, it's gonna bloom for a week or two and then kind of be done and not really provide any resources the rest of the year. And then, you know, with us, you know, management, or the lack thereof, involves a process of choosing winners and losers. Even if we choose not to manage something, it's like, well, we've kind of made a decision, you know, from one way or the other for some of the species there, or ones that will not be there. And then, you know, so many of these species, you know, we don't really touch on too much, depend on natural disturbances, you know, such as fire to maintain their habitats. Like some of those ground nesting bees you saw in the photo of the little bee in the patch of sand, that was in a recently burned site. And, you know, some of those bees depend on fire to kind of open up some bare soil patches for them to have nesting habitat that wouldn't be there otherwise, you know, so. And then, you know, when it comes to doing this like at home or anything else, you know, diversity is kind of the key. Structural diversity even, just having different sizes and shapes of different plants, you know. So the same thing goes with those bee nests with the different sized pieces of bamboo. Different sized plants are going to have different sized stems and benefit different species, you know. Having as much flowering variety as you can, flowering at different times of the year, different types of flowers, different colors, all those things, you know. And then think about flowering shrubs and trees like blueberries, you know, are very good. You know, your elderberries, button bush, um, arrowwood viburnum, some of the dogwoods and things. You know, so you can have like other types of plants beyond just flowers. And then nesting habitat, you know, bare, bare ground patches, simple things like that. We're just leaving areas unmowed, just kind of let it get weedy and natural. It goes a long way to benefiting, you know, pollinators, bees, and a whole host of other things. You know, so. And then the other nice thing about so much of this is that there's a ton of information out there. Like it's really straightforward. And there's a ton of work been done on, you know, what you can do. Like there's plant lists for New Jersey. Um, the North American Butterfly Association has some New Jersey specific plant lists. Xerxes Society partnered with Rutgers and USDA and they have a whole planting guide book for New Jersey. It's more for doing like large scale projects on like, you know, public property or golf course, thing like that. But there's a lot of good information even for the public there, you know, not knowing the diversity of the crowd who's in here tonight, it's kind of hard to steer the information one way or the other, you know, for what you do in a yard or on a golf course, I mean, little different things, but even a yard is just a, a miniature prairie, like a small prairie, like 10 by 10 can, you, you know, you plant one in a yard and then just sit back and watch and see how many cool things will turn up and give it a little bit of time and you'll have just about anything imaginable show up. And like I've lived in Edison since 2008. And like today was the first day I had an Azure, um, an Azure butterfly in my yard. I've seen like Eastern tail blues and things like that, but I never had an Azure before. And this was the first one this year, you know? So it's like, you never know what you're gonna have turn up. You know, so just some thoughts to take home on this. This is kind of the first part of the talk. There's more to, you know, about butterflies after this. You know, it's like pollinary conservation, like so many things, like we get tunnel vision on single species or habitats and it's like, you really want to look at the big picture and everything at any given site. And then like, you know, for like lands managers, ma lands managers doing good inventory work and follow-up monitoring is, is sometimes often lacking, but is essential. Like, well, what do we have here before we even start? You know, maybe we have good habitat and we don't realize it. Um, and then simple things just uh, such as changing your mowing regime can make a huge difference. Like we've done a lot of meetings and worked together with like the state park service and um, our own lands managers stay up on this. But, like, you know, just cutting back mowing you know, setting up um, a mowing rotation where it's like you're not mowing, you know, let's say a simple thing that we've done on large land, uh, large properties is instead of mowing it all at the same time is like divide it up into quarters. Mow one quarter this year, another quarter next year, or at different times during the year, you know. And I nice thing about pollinator gardens and as a great citizen science tool, um, you can kind of plant them anywhere. So like I said, I'm involved in scouts. So I do Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. And we've done pollinator gardens at our school, a couple different churches. We're doing one on a, a piece of public property near one of the middle schools near here. And you can get little patches, like every building has some patch of land that's either just wood chips or being mowed or just being neglected or whatever you want to call it, that you could easily just put a bunch of wildflowers in. And then every one of these places we put a butterfly garden in, the people at the church or the school have been like, wow, this is amazing. This is so cool. We now have monarch caterpillars here. We now have this, that. And it's just like kind of eye-opening for people. And it's like such a little thing, but it can make, you know, pay big dividends, which is very, very cool and fun. And um, we'll take a quick pause here before we go on to my second half of my talk, talking about butterflies. We've been just mostly talking about bees so far. 
but I want people to look at this photo and try and figure out what exactly is going on here because it's really kind of neat. So it looks like a bee eating another bee, which is just unusual. But there's this really cool, you know, there's really cool insects called robber flies. And they're predatory flies. If anybody's familiar with insects knows what they are. Um, I think there's 30 some species of them in New Jersey. And they're really good predators of other things. And there are some robber flies that are bumblebee mimics. And they look just like a bumblebee. Now, the things that tell them apart, like the legs are different. And they usually sit and kind of behave a little bit differently. So it's like once you've seen one, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I know what that is. I just saw one in my yard today. It's the first time, uh, not today, it's just the other day. The first one I've ever seen here of those things was just the other day. And I've been here a number of years. I've seen plenty of other places. And... Um, so just, you know, a case of mimicry, I don't know if it, the, looking like a bumblebee keeps predators away from it or it camouflages it from the other bumblebees and they, they think it's a friend and not a threat. But either way, it's a, um, a robber fly that is a bumblebee mimic eating a bumblebee, which is kind of cool. At least cool if you like insects and things like this like I do. So and the nice thing about this, I like to have people kind of look at this and realize how diverse and amazing all these insects are. Like they have a whole universe and world going on that we barely understand. And so many times with insects, like bees, they all get lumped together as bees, you know? It's like, no, no, no. Bees are very, very unique and cool. Each species is totally different. Depends on different things, different life histories. And it's like when you kind of like have like a door open to their universe, you realize how much is going on in their little world, which is fascinating. So the next part, kind of like part two of this, a lot of things to talk about, because pollinators include butterflies. And we do a lot of work on butterflies in New Jersey. Part of the reason being is a lot of them are listed species and have like um, legal protections and things like that. So when we legally protect things, you know, endangered, threatened, special concern species, you know, that means that, you know, we've gone through a, a, the Delphi process, an evaluation, like a status assessment process to determine how rare, how imperiled the species is. And then, you know, it says that we, you know, kind of says it needs legal protection and we should be doing something about the species trying to conserve it. So butterflies being pollinators too and something else uh, that we work on an awful lot with, along with bees, that kind of go with each other. Um, there are 124 different species of butterflies in New Jersey, of which about 28 of them are listed species. Um, sadly, approximately eight of them are probably extinct within the state. And like bees, even our common butterflies, a great many of them are declining. Like ones that used to be just a relatively common, gutter, uh, common garden butterfly are harder to find than they used to be. And once again, like the bees, they inhabit a wide variety of different habitats and each have unique life histories. So I'm just going to go through. This is like kind of like the portion of the slide here. Just a lot of really nice, pretty pictures of butterflies. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about each one and hopefully give you like a touch on the, an appreciation for the diversity of butterflies that are in New Jersey. Um, start off with Eastern Tiger Swallow. They're always one of my um, favorites as a kid and things like that. Absolutely beautiful butterfly. And um, they're, you know, a lot of people see them, familiar to a lot of people. You, you know, a lot of times you see them flying along roadways that are open areas. And then their caterpillars have these great markings that make it look like a little snake, you know, to protect them from birds and other things like that. Has a set of eyes on them, which is very cool. And um, the giant swallowtail is another one that presents kind of a, a unique story in New Jersey. They were present in New Jersey through about the 1970s, give or take. And then they winked out, like, you know, became extirpated for whatever reason it may be. I don't know if it was ever really clear cut. But then in about the mid-2000s, they were rediscovered. Like, um, I remember getting some of the first reports of them and being wondering, like, ah, I don't know about this. They haven't been seen in 30 years. They were coming from people that really knew butterflies. I'm like, well, they know what they're looking at. And, um, and we went out there and sure enough found a bunch of them. And, you know, like they have wings and they can, they're pretty good long distance dispersers. So they probably dispersed back to New Jersey, found a suitable habitat that still existed here and rapidly recolonized and spread. And they, you know, they've expanded the range pretty extensively in northern New Jersey, a turn of a lot of different places. They're one of the largest butterflies in New Jersey. 
new thing with them is their caterpillars versus like the tiger swallowtails is like looks like a um a little snake or something with eyes that my you know, bird might not want to eat these guys caterpillars are disguised to look like a bird dropping so that's really kind of cool from a camouflage point of view because i don't think i'd want to eat a bird dropping or anybody else would want to and a step further is if something you know makes a mistake and then um fussing with it um they often have these little feature here that will release like kind of like at least with the black swallowtails i've never smelled it of a giant swallowtail see what it smells like the you know they release a rather strong pungent odor and um it's like if you got close enough to them to fuss with them they'll release this pungent odor that makes you not want to eat them and it looks like a bird dropping which is kind of cool um black swallowtail which is um new jersey state butterfly there's another fun one for like if you build it they will come these ones are great for in your gardens and yards because they eat like parsley and dill and things like that. So, so many people always ask, well, what, is it okay to order like caterpillars online and rear them and release them? It's like, well, it's not really the best thing. You know, you're moving stuff around. You don't know, we don't know, we know very little about diseases and genetics of these species, you know? So it's not the best thing from a conservation point of view to get them. And you know, it's popular among schools and things like that. Um, but when it comes to monarchs and black swallowtails, you plant some milkweed, you plant some dill and parsley, you will get caterpillars on it eventually. You know, sometimes maybe not, but uh, like I get black swallowtail caterpillars on my dill and parsley every year. Like I, I plant tons of pots of the stuff just to get the caterpillars to rear them just for fun with my kids. I love it. So it's like, you know, I've told that the to many schools and other places, like, hey, just plant some of the food plants and then uh, the butterflies will find it, which is very fun. And black swallowtail being one of the easier ones to do. Um, cabbage white's one of the more common butterflies people see, you know, the little white butterflies that some of the first ones in spring. They're actually not native, one of the uh, two that are um, not native to New Jersey and were introduced, the other being European skipper. They don't really do much harm, you know, right now there's a lot of attention to the spotted lanternfly and other invasive species that are really problematic. Uh, you know, cabbage whites are just kind of there. They've not really done much harm to anything, the best that we can tell. But they're there and it's sometimes one of the few butterflies people see and then recognize as a butterfly, especially like in urban places, which is a value. Um, orange sulfurs, I love the sulfurs. I grew up with them being one of my favorite butterflies as a kid. Um, cloudless sulfur. And even when talking about diverse life histories, the southern species, but it, you know, a lot of these species, you know, we talk about some of the bees having like a two week flight window being done. Butterflies, some have like a small couple week flight window and then they're done for the entire year. Other ones might have two, three, four, five flights a year, where they, you know, their populations, you know, keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, monarchs kind of do the same thing as they uh, migrate northwards, which I'll, I'll touch on real quick. I should put a slide about that. Um, so this is a southern species that turns up like in the fall. So as the populations build up south of there, it, you know, erupts northwards. Now they don't overwinter here yet. That's kind of one of those things, maybe with climate change, they may at some point. Um, bronze copper, one of our state endangered butterflies and very, very rare. And um, talking about life histories and stuff, it actually overwinters an egg, which is very cool. Because so many people get used to butterflies thinking of overwintering as a pupa or a chrysalis or something like that. Um, this guy, they actually, you know, they have several flights during the course of the summer. And the last flight, they'll leave the eggs on the bases of the plants and it overwinters as an egg until the following spring. Harvesters are really neat in that they're one of the only um, predatory caterpillars. Almost every other species of caterpillar feeds on plants, whether it be leaves, stems, roots. So you start getting into moths. You know, we have 120 some species of butterflies in New Jersey. We probably have a couple thousand species of moths. And butterflies are pretty much always just eating plants and leaves and things like that. Moths, you get into diversity where some eat seeds, some eat roots, some eat stems, some eat leaves, some eat flowers. Like, Sometimes you'll have one plant with three or four different species of moths that feed on different portions of the plant, which is very cool. Uh, but getting back to the harvester, their caterpillars eat aphids, mostly on beech trees too, which is um, kind of unique linkage, you know, where there's a lot of diseases facing beech trees. Um, so there's some, some concerns about losses of beech trees due to disease, which would in turn have impacts on this um, butterfly species. So predatory caterpillars, very cool. Um, Hessel's hair streak was first discovered in New Jersey. It feeds on Atlantic white cedar. Um, it's a cedar specialist, flies early in spring. Um, and a beautiful emerald green butterfly. One of my, I, mean, I, I love them all, but this is a, another favorite of mine, which is very cool. There's a juniper hair streak that feeds on red cedar, which looks very similar, or olive hair streak, depending on how you call it. And then there's a few other species of hair streaks, a little more common. This being the coral hair streak, 
and um, and being one of the ones that's declining. It used to be relatively common, and it's like, you know, among the, the among us that you know do research on butterflies and things like that. Uh, you know, it's like huh, there's some of these common species like you just don't find coral hair streaks like you did anymore. And um, one of those things like, well, how much should we be concerned? And like, you know, the problem with like some of these common species declining is we don't know much about them. Like, you get rare ones, we spend some time studying them, we learn a little bit about their life histories. Some of the common ones we don't know so much because they're common. And then all of a sudden they start to decline. It's like, ooh, maybe we don't know enough about this. Gray hair streak. I see them here sometimes, even in my house, which is nice. Another beautiful hair streak. Red banded, you know, a little bit different patterning, red marking on the wing versus the coral has the spots. This one has the bands. Pine elfin, another one that is really neat. They feed on pine needles, obviously, by the name pine elfin. And I love the markings for anybody with South Jersey, and particularly pitch pine. They look just like pitch pine bark, which is so cool from a camouflage point of view. And I have a second photo of that just because it's so neat. And it looks just like pitch pine bark in miniature for sure, you know. So the pine elfin. Pearl crescent, a relatively common one people often encounter. Um, you see it a great many different places, which is nice. And a little small kind of low flying orangish butterfly. And caterpillars feed on asters and things like that. And as I touch on like the food plants, give you an idea how many different food plants that the caterpillars feed on. The butterflies, uh, you know, some of them specialize to a certain extent on nectar flowers, but generally it's whatever's flowering at the time that's accessible to them. But uh, most of them have very unique host plants for their caterpillars. When it comes to management, you know, your pollinated plantings, a lot of times people focus on the flowers for nectar, when you can also include food plants for the butterflies larvae, like the milkweed, you know, for them to feed upon or the parsley or, or um, dill. Silver border fritillary, um, this is one of the ones that's kind of like disappeared on like my watch, I feel like, you know, and it's a shame is that it, you know, kind of winked out statewide in 2012. And it's not really clear why. We don't know if it's a climate change thing or disease or who knows, there was a few colonies. It was, you know, it definitely was pretty rare, but the colonies were all stable and you could always find them. And then in the course of one year, they just kind of, we didn't find them the following year, which is, you know, which is kind of a depressing thing for someone in like my line of work. You know, you kind of go out looking to find these things each year and then all of a sudden you can't find them again. This being one of the last photos I ever took of one I saw in New Jersey, you know, and we haven't been able to find them since. And it's not really clear what happened. It's tough with insects in that they have, you know, like, their life history, you have like a one flight of adults and they only live for a couple weeks. You know, you have longer lived organisms like anything, like great many birds, turtles, herps, mammals, we don't call it. You know, the longer lived species, they can kind of like tolerate having a bad year or two of reproduction. It's like, well, you know, this year didn't go so well, but maybe next year will be better because I'm gonna live for the next five to 10 years, you know? But insects, you don't really have that option. So if you have a stochastic event or some other occurrence or disease or something else, we're just a shift in like phenology due to climate change and that all of a sudden their flowers or their plants emerge a couple weeks after the butterflies emerge because the butterflies were timed and popped out sooner because of the warmer weather, all of a sudden they're in real trouble. So it's, you know, makes for a lot of risk for species from a conservation point of view. Um, great spangled fritillary, another relatively common garden butterfly, big, beautiful butterfly, more common for people to see. Um, question mark which is a fun, beautiful butterfly. There's a question mark and there's a comma. And um, they like to feed on sap and things. You'll see them on trees on the side of the bark where maybe sap's leaking out or on fruit and things like that. And they have the little um, question mark marking on their wing there. And a the comma, as you would probably assume, doesn't have the little extra dot there. Now, when it comes to identifying butterflies, it can be really challenging because sometimes the little dot on these guys is diminished, but keeps it interesting. Um, Red Admiral, another beautiful butterfly on butterfly bush, another uh, semi-migratory butterfly in that they do migrate kind of south and north, not like the, in the sense the monarch does, there will be waves of them move around. Um, Compton tortoise shell, um, we have a couple of tortoise shell butterflies that are declining forest butterflies. It used to be more common and now are incredibly hard to find and sometimes not entirely clear cut as to why, you know. Um, Baltimore checker spot, um, another kind of wetland meadow kind of butterfly, absolutely beautiful um, insect. They, their caterpillars feed on turtle heads and they actually will feed on turtle head when they're smaller and then sometimes move on to other plants when they get a little bit bigger. Um, American snout, one of the few butterflies that has a little snout on his nose, aptly named. 
And then, you know, the tongue out, tasting a little bit of salt on somebody's hand. Like, a great many of these butterflies and insects, they don't just go to flowers and things for nectar. They'll go to other things. Like, sometimes you'll see them, like, on, like, you know, animal excrement on, you know, whether it be dog or deer or bear or whatever else you want to call it, rotten fruit. You know, a lot of times they'll go to other things for, like, you know, whether it be minerals. Sometimes you'll see puddling among insects where they'll go to the edges of mud puddles. Sometimes you'll see butterflies on the edges of those. They get either wood or salts or other things that they might need. So they're not entirely dependent on nectar, which is cool. Um, red spotted purple. And then I clicked over that too fast. But they're a beautiful dark colored butterfly. They're just, there's so many different varieties and shapes and colors and everything like that. So I just want to touch on a little bit of each one. The monarch, which everybody is really familiar with, especially with the population declining, um, and they migrate all the way to Mexico, which is really kind of cool. Like, there's a whole talk. We could, we could do this whole talk just on monarchs if we wanted to, about some of their life history. The really cool thing with them is the last flight in the fall migrates all the way to Mexico. I think it's about 1,800 miles, which is very cool. On the West Coast, there is a small population that overwinters in California, which is kind of unique. So when they come back in the spring, the monarchs that migrated to Mexico in the fall from New Jersey are not the ones that come back in the spring. So what happens is the first wave of monarchs migrates northwards from Mexico to like the southeastern US. They lay their eggs, they have their caterpillars, their caterpillars go through their life history, um, they make, they pupate, and they emerge as another monarch. And that monarch moves another step northwards. So when they come back northwards, they actually migrate northwards in waves, reproducing as they go. So there's like a you know, second or third wave that makes it up to the, to the north. And they'll just keep laying eggs and reproducing as long as the weather will allow them, even if the weather doesn't allow them. It's like, you know, if we can lay eggs and the caterpillars will survive, we'll go for it. So sometimes I'll get some late monarchs here in um, my yard in Edison, like in late September, October, and all of a sudden the weather's turning cold and we got a monarch emerged in a cage. And it's like, now what do we do? I remember we had a couple we had inside the house for a couple of days because it got really cold and feed them sugar water on sponges and things like that. The thought had crossed my mind to drive to Cape May to let them go, you know. And also, we had a nice sunny day, so we let them go and uh, didn't have to drive to Cape May. Um, but it was kind of one of those adaptations where, well, if the weather was still warm, hey, there'll be a few more monarchs to head south. So it's really kind of interesting that the monarch that migrated south isn't the one that migrates back north. And the monarch that is then heading back south has never been to Mexico. It's all pre-programmed in there. And just a casual observation, because I've reared a lot of them in my yard up here, and um, collect them, rear them, kids love it, and stuff like that. As every last one of them that I've released, we'll let them out in the yard, and they'll circle around, gaining height, gaining height, and then they head south. And like, I've seen it like 50 times now. It's hysterical. Like, they you know, kind of get their bearings, and they always go the right direction somehow, you know? you think one would eventually go the wrong way, you know? They've got it all figured out. And everybody always asks the difference between male and female monarchs, um, which is always a popular question. The males have the dark, dots on the wings there. So it's pretty easy to tell them apart when you get a good look at them, which is cool. And the next is the Viceroy. Um, getting back to mimicry, like our little um, robber fly mimic there before, the Viceroy is a mimic of the monarch because the monarch tastes bad and birds don't like to eat it because it eats milkweed, which is noxious. The Viceroy, on the other hand, is probably rather tasty, except that it doesn't look like it because it looks like a monarch. There's very subtle differences. It's mostly in the markings on the edges of the wings here, which is kind of shaped more like crescents and things like that, versus on the monarch, you have more those dots. There's some veining differences and other things like that. And the coloration is a little bit different too. But the Viceroy is a mimic of the monarch, which is very cool from an evolution point of view. Um, little wood satyrs. You'll see these guys hiking around trails and bars, little brown butterflies, kind of fluttering down close to the ground, edges of the woods. Mitchell Sater, one of another ones that's an endangered species, has been extirpated since probably about 1985. There was a small colony that was left and then probably collected out at the time. You know, it's suspected, but not entirely true. Um, you know, collection of insects doesn't really occur too much anymore. But yet it, every now and then you'll have people go out to try and collect and uh, sell these things for money. It's happened even relatively recently. So it's like, you always have to be kind of on the watch. To, you, know, you never know what someone is going to do. A wood nymph um, on dog bane, another beautiful one, a little, you know, bigger than the Saturn. It's got that kind of tan markings, you know, the edges, usually on the edges of fields and woods edges. Another common butterfly um, for your gardens and things is a silver spotted skipper. 
the big kind of very strong flying skipper you'll see in your gardens pretty often. Um, common checkered, checkered skipper, you know, black and white patterning on it. All beautiful butterflies. And if you're looking for any of these, like I said, the talk was um, put together by um, some members of the North American Butterfly Association and um, their website has a wealth of information and great photos and identification keys and everything like that. Um, Ergo skipper, another one of our rare butterflies in New Jersey, one of the biggest populations on Fort Dix. Another one of our disturbance dependent species depends on fire to maintain its habitats. That without fire, the habitat grows up. It depends on pine barrens, regress savannas. They're very fire dependent. And out in the impact area of Fort Dix, there's certainly a lot of fire. So it gets to be maintained and beautiful for these butterflies. Interesting story with the Aragos, just real quick, is they are found in North Jersey too. Um, there's populations in both Morris County and in Southern New Jersey. In the pine barrens, they use different food plants. They have different flight windows, um, different phenology, everything, which is really interesting. They are the same species, but up north they feed on little blue stem grass and fly like <clears throat> like early July, midsummer. While the southern species are late July, early August, and feed on pine barrens regress. Up north it's like xeric grassland habitats, down south it's wet meadows and wet prairies. So totally different habitats for the same species within the same state. Very cool. Um, fiery skipper, real bright orange. Another southern species that works its way northwards, you know, late summer, early fall. Um, Broadwing skipper, this is one of our um, marsh and wetland kind of skippers. You know, they feed on like uh, wild rice and other things in, in marsh areas, which is very cool. There's a handful, of, I mean, thinking about your butterflies in different habitats, just like the bees, you have butterflies that live in the marsh areas and depend on marsh and not your stereotypical pollinator habitats. And um, here's a rare skipper, which is an, another wetland butterfly species right here it's called rare skipper next to a broad wing um, there's actually all three species there's also a salt marsh skipper they're all in the garden my parents garden at the same time but I couldn't get a photo of all three of them on the same plant as hard as I tried um, rare skipper is a um, feeds on salt marsh corn cord grass feeder and is another marsh species and you don't really see it unless you get lucky to have like flowers near the marsh luckily my parents garden with a lot of milkweed is really close to the marsh nearby and we get a lot of rare skippers there every year uh, and a quick story on this species is that it uh, had a range extension in New Jersey in like the 1990s. Didn't exist in, exist in New Jersey before then. And the population was kind of expanding northwards and declining south of here actually. So it's probably a climate change related thing with the species range moving northwards as time goes on. Leonard Skipper, um, another one of our rare species, it occurs statewide, but always in very low numbers. You know, like some of these species, you find tons of them hundreds of them in any given site, very common. And then other species, their life histories are kind of unique in that, you know, you find one here, one there, very low densities were scattered about, Leonard Skipper generally being one of them. Sometimes you find larger numbers of them, but boy, you know, a lot of times you see just one here, one there. Dusted Skipper, another one of our early grass skippers. Northern Metal Mark, and one we're doing a lot of habitat work for right now, they depend on red cedar glades in North Jersey. One of the biggest threats to them is invasive plants, invasive shrubs, autumn olive, um, honeysuckles, barberries, multiflora rose, just you name it. And any of the stuff that invades the woods um, and you know just shades out their glade, shades out the nectar, and the species declines because of it. Stilt grass is another problem for them. So we're doing a lot of like invasive species control, invasive plant control at some of the habitat sites to try and preserve this species in New Jersey. Um, checkered white, another. Um, Interesting one. It's a pretty rare species, but they go through huge population bursts. Like we had a huge one down in southern New Jersey, like 2011, 2012, whatever. Thousands of these things, thousands of them. For being a relatively rare butterfly, it can have massive eruptions, and maybe that's just part of its life history. Maybe it kind of goes along at very small numbers and then has boom years, you know. The more we study these things, the more we learn and the more we realize we do not know. Frosted elephant, another one we do a lot of habitat work. Not a very rare one. New Jersey is probably the stronghold in the northeastern United States for this species. Depends on disturbance, open habitats, feeds on wild indigo, baptisia, you know, um, and very restricted now to sites like right of ways and power lines and things that are that are maintained and disturbed and open. A very elephant, another kind of fun one that I like. It's we're at the very southern edge of its range in the eastern United States. This kind of a glacial relic, and I find them really xeric pine barrens, areas of southern New Jersey, where there's bearberry, that is its food plant. It flies very early on in the spring as well. 
And then uh, another last Pine Barrens one, the Georgia or Helicta Satter. I put both names on there. Everybody calls it Georgia Satter, but then they're going through like a literature search and people are doing research one day and realize that um, someone named Helicta described it, named it prior to other people describing it. So we give it the appropriate name from a taxonomic point of view, but found in Pine Barrens, um, meadows and grassy areas. It feeds on sedges, but we don't know exactly which ones. Another one, you know, maintained by fire, disturbs the habitats, opening them up. And then getting to the kind of the end here, <clears throat> kind of wrapping up all the butterfly photos and things. I always thought this slide was kind of funny about <clears throat> what biologists are and art and stuff like that. And um, we'll open up the questions in a moment, but like, there's a lot of information to go over, and like a lot of really cool species and stuff. And they're wonderful to work with. Like, I love my job. I love working with insects and doing conservation work. It's a lot of fun. And working with like Division Fish and Wildlife is really kind of interesting in that we work with like so many different people doing different things. So we have people that specialize in herps and snakes. We have people that specialize in marine fish. We have people that just handle lands management, managing um, our habitats. People that are working on every species that we have here in the state. So it's a very kind of a, a diverse and fun place to work and learn about, uh, <laughs> and learn what everybody else is doing. And, you know, expand the knowledge of everybody else's like some of the stuff that I've done. So I'm hoping that everybody's enjoyed this and hopefully it's worked. And there's a lot of information to talk about and my voice hasn't given out. And um, we can open it up some questions about things and hopefully you've enjoyed it. Thanks, Rob. So we do have a couple of questions that came in while you're talking. Uh, the first is from Michael and he wants to know how damaging is the mosquito spray that everyone pays to have done? It depends on how they do it. It's worse for some things than others. So they, they all depends on the mosquito spray you're talking about, too. So if you're spraying your yards and you're not being too careful about it, you know, any insecticide is going to kill the other insects in your yard and stuff like that. When you're doing the aerial spray and stuff like that, they try to target it for the flights of the mosquitoes in the evenings at night when they're up higher. And, like, it's less likely for other things to be flying, so it's not as impactful. But, like, it's like so many things, you know, any insecticide, pesticide, herbicide, it's like if you use it carefully in the right way, it can do the good you want it to. But if you're not careful about it, it can do quite a bit of harm too. And when it comes to mosquitoes, they do a lot of other things too. So they do a lot of larviciding, which is very specific just to mosquitoes. And that's where I put like the pellets in the water that, uh, you know, only kills the mosquito larvae. You know, that's not as impactful on other things. When you're doing like aerial spraying, it can have a negative impact on other species around. We do have like BMPs and guidelines to try and, you know, minimize those impacts. But like so many things we do, there's, there's trade-offs between like conservation and public safety. You know, like a lot of diseases are spread by mosquitoes and they can be a public nuisance. So we just try to do the best that we can and like provide guidance so that they don't have the, as many negative impacts. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Eloy and he wants to know, uh, how can I redirect carpenter, carpenter bees away from using the garage wood trim as their home? There's not much you can do because I have tried. <laughs> Unfortunately, like carpenter bees, other than like, you know, doing like tin or screens or other things to keep them from going in there, plugging all their holes up. Even that doesn't work. They just go drill someplace else. There's, you know, it's kind of hard to get away. You can make traps and things. You know, you hate to go kill the poor things, but they're destroying something and being destructive. You know, there are like safer ways of doing it. Like a lot of people use like little traps to catch them, you know, and kill. It kills the poor bee, unfortunately, but it can be destructive to certain portions of your household. I mean, you could put like, you know, it's funny, I mean, you could put wood out there, the natural habitat is dead trees and things like that, but it's like, they'll just make more and they'll just keep chewing on your house, you know? It's just one of those things, there's not much to do. You just kind of got to live with them, at least, you know, I always have, you know? I mean, I love insects and all, but I remember as like a kid, like on my parents' farm, like our grandmother painted us like, like, I don't know, five cents of beef, like what they would like, badminton rackets and kill as many of them as we could <laughs> so keep us kids out of trouble we'd make a little bit of money and then next year to be just as many carpenter bees we i spent most of my childhood killing carpenter bees and there's just as many there today as there were 30 years ago <laughs> and the buildings are still standing so <laughs> great thank you um the next one goes back to our poll question and the question is are wasps pollinators and are you counting wasps in the 300 plus count and also, what's the difference between a bee and a wasp? A couple of questions. So we're not counting wasps in the 350 um, species. That's just bees, pollinating bees. Um, wasps do pollinate. They don't do as much as bees. They will go to nectar and things like that and utilize it in small amounts. So it's like not 
they're pollinators in a very small sense. You know, some wasps visit flowers more than others. It's more of an opportunistic thing for them. It's just like flies, like Searford flies will visit flowers. But like when, like I like, you know, I don't like to dismiss different species. It's like, I don't like having a tunnel vision of just pollinating bees. And um, it's like, well, there's a lot of other things that do do some pollination. And, you know, you know, every little bit adds up to something. And then telling them apart, it's a lot of it's just related to the pollen carrying structures on them. So they're very, very similar to each other, like structurally, you know, and their body, wings, and everything else. Then it comes down to the you know, pollen carrying structures on their legs or bodies and things like that. And like even those features are pretty diverse among the different types of bees and that, you know, you'll see the bees with the pollen clumps on their legs or on their bodies and things like that. So most of the biggest differences are related to how they transport pollen. You know, while wasps and things are predatory, they eat other insects and they hunt and you know, eat other insects and feed that to their larvae and things like that. You know, they're not out there actively seeking pollen, even though they will visit uh, flowers on occasion. It's just more of a target opportunity, I guess, more than anything. Right. Here's a great one from Gary. It's a biology question. Some bees seem to make linear multi-chamber tunnels to lay eggs. The egg in the furthest, deepest, most distal chamber would be the first to be laid. When the egg hatches, does the larva leave the chamber through the other chambers, forge a new way out, or wait till the other chambers are empty? That's a good one. It's really like a great question. Stuff like that, yeah. Because it's like, it must be all related to like hormones and things like that. And then being in association with the other um, eggs and nests near there. Because they don't generally go out another way. They always come out the front. So it's like the last one laid always has to be the first one to hatch. And I don't know if anybody's really, like I've never heard a good answer on it other than it's probably just one of genetically or hormonally kind of program things in there. And they all just kind of grow and develop pretty quickly too. So the window of emergence might be relatively close in that. The one starting to work his way through as the other ones are too. But good question. I don't have like a hundred percent answer for you on that just because I don't know if I've ever heard a good answer on it either, you know, and it's different for the different species too. But Cool. All right. That was, that was a very good question. Um, the next one comes from Karen and she was curious about what the rusty patch bee is a specialist on. The rusty patch bee wasn't really much of a specialist. It was a bumblebee and a relatively common one of that, just like some of the other ones that we see down in southern New Jersey. And it used to be one of the more common species encounters. It wasn't really a specialist. And the, the strongest suspicion is that it was probably a foreign disease that um, wiped it out, you know, because a lot of other bees were brought in from Europe and things like that. And a lot of pathogens came with them. But it was one of those ones that, like, there's just, we don't know. It's a troubling thing with insects. like. You know, we know so little about the insects in general, never mind the diseases that affect them and things like that. And um, it kind of went down a relatively short period of time and, re and pretty much range wide. You know, there's very few of them found anywhere in the eastern U.S. Um, <coughs> anymore. So it wasn't really a specialist bee. It was one of those ones that was probably impacted by some foreign pathogen. And um, the tough thing with wildlife and wildlife disease is like, if you have like agriculture farming, you have a disease impact your, your stock or whatever it is, you see it and, and it's obvious relatively quickly. Among wildlife populations, it's always like we're always kind of behind the curve because there's no way of knowing animals are sick until they're either gone. And then a lot of animals like in the environment just they don't last long in the environment. Like an animal dies and it gets decomposed pretty quickly by things that eat that animals or just a decomposing environment. So it's like even with among insects and things, it's like it kind of happens so rapidly. It's like you don't know there's a disease until it's too late because it's not like you see sick bees, not that they come to a rehab center sick or something like that, you know, so. I don't know, one of those unfortunate ones that we just don't know that much about what happened with it. Great, thank you. So the next question actually comes from two different people. Um, Mary and Kenneth want to know, what can we do about the deer who love to eat all the plants that we plant for the pollinators? <laughs> so it's a million dollar question there, you know. <laughs> deer too with pollinator plantings. Because even if it's something that doesn't taste good, they'll often give it a taste and a pull and yank it out. Because I've seen that with like so many plantings and plugs. It's like this is milkweed. It doesn't taste good. But they'll give it a go just for the laugh of it, you know. Yeah, it's tough. Other than putting like netting around or fencing and stuff like that, especially if you're in an area like 
where there's piles of deer coming into your yards, you know. It's, it's always like, I have these beautiful flowers, but I got to surround them with netting so I can't enjoy them. My parents' yard's like that. And like it's not like my deer, you know, we deer hunt my parents' farm, and it's down at Pine Barrens. It's not like an area with, like, high deer density. It's pretty rural. But the deer come in there and just, like, eat whatever they want. They'll get a nice tulip just about to bloom, and whoop, gone, you know, it's morning, you know. It's just kind of one of those facts of life. But there's not much you can do. I, uh, some people use those sprays and things. I don't know how really effective they are. But that fencing and netting and things like that. When it comes to fencing, doesn't, you know, a lot of people worry about getting tall fencing to keep them out of gardens and things like that. If it's a small square footage, they'll be nervous to jump into it. So even a small amount of footage, you know, fencing or strings, like if it's a small little area, they're nervous to jump into it out of concern of jumping out of it. So if you have a big area of fence with a low fence, they'll jump into it because it's like, well, I got a big enough area I can get back out of it. So you need a tall fence to keep them out of it. But if it's like smaller areas, you know, like 10 foot or other things like that, small garden patches and things, it's too small an area for them to safely jump into and feel safe getting back out again. So sometimes you can have like strings or small fencing, it's just a deterrent if it's small kind of patches, you know, just enough to keep them away from it, you know. It's fun planting pollinator plantings because we did one by another church by me, and there are tons of deer there. And it's very obvious what the deer like to eat and what the deer don't like to eat. Which is kind of fun, you know. <laughs> it's like, well, no point in playing that again. <laughs> Great. Um, Sue wants to know: Are you avoiding the neonics as you're planting seed sources? Yes, we try to avoid those just because they're systemic pesticides, you know, and like they impact, you know, any insect that then feeds upon it, you know. So we try to recommend against doing it for any like pollinator plants. You got to watch too, like when you get them at some stores, make sure it's not treated with it, you know, because it's just, you know. Not healthy to any insect that's going to feed on the plant. You know, it's an effective pesticide for controlling pests and stuff like that for sure. But you know, your bees and your butterflies that like to go to these things are going to be negatively impacted by it. So like with us, yeah, no, we don't use any treated seeds or anything like that at the state. You know, we avoid that. Here's a good biology question from Jill. She wants to know how do bees that live in the ground survive after heavy rains? The ones that live in the ground, well, the larvae are pretty well adapted for it, and it, like the tunnels are usually well drained and things like that. And most of these things are just adapted for just being in the environment, and surviving, being immersed. You know, if it's like standing puddled water, probably not good. But like a lot of those ground nesting bees are ground nesting in relatively well drained kind of soils and sites. So I think some of the site selection probably goes into the survivorship as well. In that, you know, they're not going to be ground nesting in like a wetland or a low spot. Most of the time, it's like open, bare kind of patchy soils that are generally a little bit like looser and well drained and things like that, you know. So, most of the, it's funny as we study these um, insects and any number, any wildlife for that matter, it's like the more you study them, the more you realize like how they have it all worked out. Like, they, you know, whether it be timing to flowering of a specific species or using a specific resource to make their nest or using a certain feature in the habitat, looking for little stems in the right, like they, you know, they could call it, I call it intelligence, but it's like, they're, they're really intelligent. Like they have a lot of this stuff figured out, you know? I can tell other stories about other species of insects, like dragonflies and things about like how they've got things like worked out and know what they're doing. Like, and bees are the same way. Like they're very selective in where they're gonna have their nests to make sure that it's a good site for survival. And that's probably a big part of it. And a lot of them are very well adapted to live in the environment. <laughs> Okay, Marie wants to know, what's the state doing to create no mo zones to support birds, pollinators, and wildlife? Yeah, so we've been doing a lot of this. So, so we've had the meetings with the Department of Transportation and working together with them to like, you know, if there's places you can't mow or don't need to mow, don't mow. Um, you know, obviously there's some safety things along roadways. We have to have mowed from a fire safety point of view and, you know, from like a vehicle hazard point of view, be able to see the deer, whether it makes a difference or not, I don't know, you know, but it seems like the deer just appear. But um, like within like parks, especially, we've had a lot of meetings with all the maintenance staff and all the superintendents and everything else. We've been working together with them, like making an initiative of like, hey, if you don't need to mow something, leave it unmoved. Pick patches and um, leave them as prairie or pollinator habitat. We've been doing a lot of planting. So we've been kind of making a push statewide. You know, fish and wildlife, we don't generally mow too much to begin with because it's like, we're about wildlife manager. So we'll mow you know, paths and things around buildings. It's not like we're mowing like sports fields and stuff like that. But the park service, you know, is a big push, you know, throughout the state park service, you know, cut back on mowing wherever they can. Great, thank you. Um, Debbie was curious about the species that basically disappeared from New Jersey in 2012, Rob. 
Um, yeah. Does that have had anything to possibly do with Hurricane Sandy? I don't think so. Because um, Sandy was in the fall of 2012. Yeah, I mean, I find it unlikely. Uh, you know, it was related to Sandy. Um, they were you know, it just kind of winked out statewide. Impacts from Sandy weren't necessarily statewide. Some of the colonies are pretty far up north, pretty well, you know, isolated from some of the um, flooding impacts and things like that. I mean, it's possible, you know, it's it's really hard to say, you know, it's possible to storm like that to like bring some kind of pathogen or something else that you know, kind of happens with um, what was it EHD and like southern midges among deer and stuff like that. Signs of really the storms and things, but um, no, I mean, really hard to say. It was one of those ones that we just kind of left scratching our heads. <laughs> All right, we're running out of time. So I'm gonna have one more question for you okay. and then we'll wrap up. Um, is there any disease affecting the wild bees that are hurting the population? Any disease? Yeah. So not really, I mean, there's a variety of different diseases and pathogens that they find among like honeybees and um, bumblebees, which are like the ones that are reared and things like that. Um, and then documenting them in the wild populations have been kind of tough because it's hard to really sample for diseases because by the time you realize a disease is there, it's long since passed and the you know insects have died. So like, I don't know how much sampling's really occurred to, to, to actually document diseases among the wild populations. You know, a lot of it's just kind of like conjecture in that, you know, we know what the non-native pathogens are and the species they impact, and that they're not native to North America. And then you see the kind of, bees declining or certain species groups that kind of go through a sudden population collapse is just kind of trying to put one-on-one -on -one together but to actually test for it and find it you know is really challenging i don't know if many people doing that level of research on it you know it'd have to be like genetics and things like that thank you all yeah thank you yeah pollinators are a fun thing to do and doing pollinator gardens is such an easy thing. Anyone can put like a corner of their yard into wildflowers or other things and they have a lot of fun with it. And I'd recommend it to anybody. You can tell you have fun. <laughs> exactly. The less grass to mow, the better. <laughs>